Uh, there's a thing that worries us now much, much less than it worried first century believers. In fact, we're so used to it, I think, that it hardly worries us at all. I wonder if you can guess what it is. Food sacrifice to idols, we don't worry about that too much, do we? It's not your problem, is it? Popping down the idol temple for a kebab, it's not usually a problem. The threat of persecution, well, probably worries us a bit less than it worried them. There's a candidate, certainly, but it's not the one I'm thinking about. The thing that was really worrying was Paul's imprisonment. A very worrying thing. Why? Well, cast your mind to the the history of God's dealing with human beings. Some of the big names in the Bible. Abraham, Moses, David, Jerusalem at the center of God's activity. Thousands of years of God working in a certain way. And then, out of the blue, AD 47-ish, halfway through the first century, a Pharisee starts wandering round the Mediterranean proclaiming that Gentiles can belong to Israel's Messiah without becoming Jewish. And he does that for 10 years, and then he's arrested. How unsettling that would be for Paul's churches. Now, we are used to Paul's sufferings, aren't we? We're used to this. But for his churches, what a shock that their theologically new kid on the block, evangelist, is now in prison and facing death. And the pressure to turn to something more impressive looking must have been overwhelming. It doesn't look good, does it? You step out into, onto, the, onto the Mediterranean stage and you do 10 years of this revolutionary message and then you're in prison. And for the best part of the next decades, Paul, Paul spends most of his time in prison. And then he's dead. Very unnerving, don't you think, for those who've believed in his message, who've welcomed it. All Paul's later letters deal with this subject in one way or another, his imprisonment. It's very worrying. Now the headline imperative in this letter reflects that, doesn't it? Chapter 1, verse 8 again. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel. Repeated in slightly different language in verse 13. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me. A pattern that involved me in prison. (laughs) And chapter 1 ends with those two highly motivational examples. The Asian deserters, Onesiphorus and household. And in chapter 2, verse 1, the spotlight turns on Timothy. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul, Paul's big aim in this letter is to strengthen Timothy in the pattern that Paul himself has been following and to get him to come to Rome. But there are some things to be done in the meantime. And so I think there are two questions uh, alive by the time we get to the end of chapter one. Number one, what's it going to look like for Timothy to be unashamed of Paul? and to follow the pattern of his words. And related to that, we've touched on it already, in what, may, in what way might he be under pressure to drift away from that pattern and need to move towards it again? Well, chapter two, I think, begins to introduce us to what ministry in Ephesus is actually like for Timothy. For in ta- chapter two, we meet for the first time his opponent's the people Timothy is actually having to interact with on the ground. And in chapter 2, we meet for the first time certain ways in which Timothy's activity might need to change in line with Paul's pattern. Now, the main focus in this chapter is not on the opponents, but on Timothy and his activity, and especially his speech. 
the way he speaks. And the big issue in this chapter is, will Timothy speak according to the pattern of the sound words that he heard from Paul? Will he speak in a Pauline and Christ-like way? So before we look at Timothy and his speech, let's have a quick look at the opponents and their speech. We meet them in verse 16. Turn to verse 16, please. Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hyanmenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. Hymenaeus and Philetus are resurrection past already, guys. That's the sort of thing they are. Now, this is really important. It sheds light on an issue running all the way through this letter, an issue of timing. We mentioned it this morning, didn't we? 1-1, Paul's apostleship is according to the promise of life that's in Christ Jesus. 1-10, Jesus has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light, but the present experience of the teacher of this message is not that of life and immortality, but of suffering, verse 12. 118, the excellent Onesiphorus. He's come to Rome, but notice the beginning of verse 18, may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. The day in question is the last day. There's a big timing issue in this letter. According, according to Paul's pattern of life, it's that day, the day when Jesus returns, that's the big day. According to Hymenaeus and Philetus, the resurrection is past already. Do you see that? Paul has in mind resurrection day. These guys, difficult to know exactly what the flavor of their past readiness is, they think they're living some sort of resurrected life already. And I think you can pretty much guarantee that their version sounds and looks better than an imprisoned apostle. It'd be quite hard to say that you were a resurrection past already guy if you were imprisoned, wouldn't it? In fact, when we get to chapter 3, a bit later on, we'll find things suggesting that they might in fact look very impressive, these people, very impressive. Here, two things are noted about their resurrection past already talk. Look at verse 17. The first is that it's actually very dangerous indeed. Their talk will spread like gangrene, verse 17. Now, at the risk of um, postprandial upset, let me get a little medical for a moment. We hardly see any of the kind of gangrene that Paul has in mind here. And the reason for that is that when people have nasty wounds, they get properly surgically cleaned up under anesthetic. But take yourselves back to the days before anesthesia, when wounds could not be cleaned properly. Gas gangrene, which is what he's talking about here, was a very common accompaniment of dirty wounds and a very common cause of death. And that is why on all those buccaneering and seafaring movies, you get people with wounds swallowing large quantities of rum and biting on bullets while the ship's surgeon saws their arm off. Because if you don't remove the grubby, wounded arm before the gangrene sets in, that's the end. Uh, in my medical practice, I only ever saw one case of gas gangrene. It's very rare now. A guy with a minor injury to his foot that had not been cleaned. A couple of days later, you could see the infection advancing inches every hour up his leg. He was extremely ill. 
and in the end he lost the whole leg and nearly his life. When Paul uses this imagery, he means to shock. Gangrene? Really? As bad as that? Notice again, it's very unlikely that they presented, sorry, it's very likely that they presented a much more attractive looking pattern of life than Paul did in prison. But Paul describes the effects of their talk in the most extreme terms, as dangerous as gangrene. So here's a thought. Is he wanting to wake Timothy up to something he doesn't quite see as clearly as he ought from where he's sitting? Why use that kind of imagery if it were already obvious that their talk was dangerous? Now we'll come back to this later because in chapter 3 we'll meet another occasion where Paul is using shocking language to bring to the surface things which may not be as obvious as one would, as one would think. The second thing that's noted here about their speech is that their speech is associated with quarreling. Indeed, it seems to thrive on it. Verse 14, there's quarreling going on in Ephesus. It's damaging. And the more the quarreling, the more the ungodliness. Verse 16, and the worse the gangrene. So those are the opponents and their speech. Very dangerous it is, says Paul. Now let's look at Timothy and his speech. And I think the chapter really divides into two on this. First, Timothy must pass on Paul's message faithfully. And second, Timothy must correct error peaceably. So let's look at the first of these. Timothy needs to pass on Paul's message faithfully. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Notice there are four generations in view in this verse. Paul, Timothy, those Timothy passes the message on to and those they pass the message on to. It's an absolutely core cool feature of Paul's pattern of ministry that he equips others to equip others, to equip others, to equip others. Now notice, we, we, we mentioned this morning that it's a key feature of, church, of, 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 of normal ministry to pull churches and individuals back to the truth. Well, one of the things that very quickly drops off the agenda when the pressure is on is equipping other people for the work of ministry. Isn't it striking that that command to be strengthened and to equip others is followed immediately by a section that emphasizes how difficult the work is. It's difficult work to equip others for the work of ministry. And there are three uncomfortable illustrations in verse three onwards. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It's the hard-working father who ought to have their first share of crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Now notice, there are three illustrations here, and they all have some sort of difficulty embedded in them. Soldiers do not get involved in the ordinary things that civilians do. Not if they want to gain the approval of the one who enlisted them. An athlete does not get the winner's crown by cutting corners. There will be no harvest at all for a farmer who doesn't work hard. There's difficulty involved in each of these. But the real punch of these illustrations comes in verse 7. You think about these. The Lord has something to say to you. Now, for example, just, just think about this. For, um, you get a little card through the letterbox tomorrow morning, and it says, I've been thinking a lot about you. I want you to remember that uh, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, and I want you to remember that no athlete is crowned unless he competes according to the rules, and I want you to remember that only hard-working only hard farmers get the um, 
get the, get the crops. The Lord has something to say to you in these illustrations. How would that grab you? Just talk to your neighbor for 30 seconds. Okay, folks, that's 30 seconds. Now, I don't know how you would feel about that, but I'm hoping I never get a postcard like that. It's quite pointy, isn't it? You a proper soldier? You running the race according to the rules? You working hard, Timothy? The Lord has something to say to you. It's a very pointy little set of illustrations, isn't it? Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. You've got something to understand here. But it's followed up with something even stronger. <laughs> and what follows it is a reminder of how the strengthening grace that's in Christ Jesus plays out. What does 2-1 be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus? What does that mean exactly? Well, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel for which I'm suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Remember the Jesus I preach, the risen Jesus. Here's the question. What pattern of strengthening does the strengthening grace of the risen Jesus produce? Well, I think verse 8 outlines two phases in the experience of Jesus. There's a pre-resurrection phase... A phase, that, a phase that describes Jesus, where Jesus is described according to his human descent, descended from David, and a post-resurrection from that phase, risen from the dead. Uh, Paul does a similar thing in Romans chapter 1. He talks about Jesus descended from David according to the flesh, but designated son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. I think that's emphasizing, the same as it's emphasizing here, for Jesus there was a pre-resurrection phase and there was a resurrected phase. So here's the question again. What pattern of life does the power of the risen Jesus produce in those who follow him? The answer is, the risen Jesus produces a pre-resurrection pattern of life in those who follow him. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering bound with chains as a criminal. I'm following now after the pattern of one who was himself suffering as a criminal. So here's a question, folks. What does the spirit of the glorified Lord Jesus Christ, what does that spirit poured out at Pentecost produce in believers? Let me put it differently. Does the spirit of the risen, ascended, glorified Christ produce a risen-looking, ascended-looking, glorified-looking pattern of life in those who follow him? Answer, no, it does not. He does not. Brothers and sisters, until we die, 
The spirit of the risen, glorified Christ produces the pre-death pattern of his son in our lives. Let me say it again. Until we die, the spirit that the Lord Jesus poured out produces a pre-death pattern of life in our lives. Not a post-death resurrection pattern. Hymenaeus and Philetus, they are resurrection past already guys. But Paul, the one who does follow the pattern of the risen Jesus, he's a pre-resurrection guy. Do you see that? It's so important this. Which pattern is authentic? Which pattern is the strengthened by grace pattern? Answer, Paul's is because it follows Jesus' pattern. Jesus strengthens believers by his spirit to live according to his pattern through suffering now to death and then resurrection on the last day. Jesus experienced the resurrection of the dead in advance. We experience the resurrection of the dead on the last day. And until that day, we are conformed to Jesus' on the road to the cross pattern of life. And that is exactly what he says in verse 10. Therefore, I endure, as Jesus did, everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. Boom, with eternal glory, <laughs> do you see? But glory on the last day, not in this day, not until then. Now, brothers and sisters, this is massively important. It's the biggest theological issue in this letter, I think. And it's intensely practical. If you sometimes worry that the pattern of ministry in your life feels not very glorious, if it's hard if it requires exacting discipline, if you're often just really tired from doing the stuff again that the Lord has given you to do, on those days when you just wish that you felt a bit more resurrection past already-ish, don't you wish that you'd wake up in the morning feeling, I wish, I wish, I feel all resurrection past already-ish today. That'd be great, wouldn't it? but it's not the pattern. Because I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I was very struck by this way early on in ministry life at teaching Sunday school. You know how it is with teaching Sunday school? But if you've done it, you'll know what it's like. You know, you work really... When we did Sunday school, Annie and I, it took us all day Saturday to do it. I mean, all day. You know, we get up, have a little bit, a little bit of a sleep in and get up and think, okay, we've got to teach the Bible to some eight-year-olds tomorrow. How are we going to do that? So we look at the passage and it takes a long time to try and understand the passage properly. And then um, once we've understood the passage properly, you think, okay, now how am I going to teach this to a bunch of eight-year-olds? And you work on that for another few hours until by about 10 in the evening, you think, Okay, I now know how I'm going to teach this. I now know also the vital visual aid I'll need to teach this. And have you ever had the 10, of the 10 in the evening dash to the supermarket to get the props that you'll need to construct? Yeah, I know you, you do too. Uh, to, to construct the vital visual aid that you need to teach these people tomorrow morning. And you rock up tomorrow morning and Sunday morning and they come in and they look just the same as they did last week. And you spend the next 40 minutes in kind of organized crowd control and you try and teach them a few things with your excellent visual aid, which actually isn't working as well as you thought it would. And then after 40 minutes, they rush out again, looking very much the same as they came in. How many weeks do you have to do that before you wonder if you're really doing the real thing? And you know you can multiply that in your home group and your congregational life and all kinds of stuff doesn't look all that powerful, does it? The ministry of God's word. Well, if you feel like that sometimes, take heart because the strengthening power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ produces a cruciform pattern. A cruciform pattern 
in the lives of those who belong to him and expending yourself through difficulty for the sake of the salvation of others. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. One day, it'll look so glorious, but not now. Now, present endurance of difficulty for the sake of the salvation of others is the power of the risen Christ at work. That's what Paul is saying here. What would he have to do to escape the difficulty? Well, I want you to look for a, uh, with your neighbor at verse 10. There's a little equation embedded in verse 10 that's really important. Uh, let me read verse 10, and then I'll give you a little exercise to do. Sorry, verse 9. For which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Now, with your neighbor, please, just for 30 seconds again, what's the link between Paul being bound as a criminal and God's word not being bound? What's the link between those? Just talk about that to your neighbor for a moment, please. Excellent. That's 30 seconds. Okay. There is a little equation embedded in this, I think, and it goes like this. Bound with chains as a criminal equals unbound word of God. Why is that the equation? Why is the word of God not bound? The word of God is not bound because Paul is willing to be bound. What would you do to es what would you have to do to escape being bound? Well, all you would have to do is to tweak the message. That's all you would have to do. Just change the message a bit. But Paul is unwilling to change the message. He wants the message to be unbound, and that means he is. <laughs> it's from his message that the suffering comes, do you see? So the true pattern is verse 11, Death now, life in the future. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. On the other hand, if we deny him, he also will deny us. He will be faithful because he can't be unfaithful. Endurance of difficulty now, reigning with Christ in the future. Denial of that pattern, disaster in the future. But that is exactly what Hymenaeus and Philetus are doing. Theirs is not a resurrection. Theirs, theirs is not a suffering pattern of life. Now we get the same pattern in chapter 4. Just look over in chapter 4 in a moment. We'll come back to chapter 4 a bit later on. But... Let's look at chapter 4 and look at verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul, uh, what does it feel like to fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith? What does it feel like as you approach the end of that race and that fight? Well, it feels like verse 6, being poured out as a drink offering, which I imagine doesn't feel very comfortable, do you think? It's sacrificial language. But Paul, what's the outcome of that going to be? Verse 8, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who've loved his appearing. Do you see that? There's just cruciformity all over this letter. Uh, look at uh, cruciformity in verse 16 of chapter 4. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. If you remember, 
This is so pertinent to, our, to, to this week, isn't it? Where we remember the last week of the life of Jesus, where having been gloriously welcomed into Jerusalem by a massive crowd, he ends up completely on his own, one individual, all on his own. The crowd calls for him to be crucified, his friends depart. At the end of the story, there is one person, center stage, enduring the hostility of the world. Why is he doing it? For the sake of his chosen ones. And what does he say on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Look at verse 16. May it not be charged against them. It's so cruciform that, isn't it? Just like the death of Jesus. But the Lord strengthened me, verse 17. And what was it like, Paul? Did it feel really spookily good to have the Lord strengthening you? Well, not so much. <laughs> The, the evidence of God strengthening me was that the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. The evidence of God strengthening me was that even in that very difficult situation, I was enabled to speak the truth truly so that the Gentiles might hear it. So what does being strengthened by Jesus look like? Well, it looks like praying for mercy for people who've deserted. It looks like speaking the message in a hostile setting being strengthened by Jesus looks Jesus-like. Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. It's going to look Jesus-like. Embrace Christ's endurance now, glory later pattern of life. Pass on the message faithfully. So Timothy must pass on Paul's message faithfully. Okay, secondly, Timothy must correct error peaceably. From verse 14 to the end, the emphasis on how to engage with untruth. And all the way through this section, uh, the emphasis is not so much on what to say, but how to say it. We get a household illustration in the middle, verse 20. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver but also wood and clay, some for honourable use, some for dishonourable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what's dishonourable, he'll be a vessel for honourable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Uh, this illustration, I think, uh, is one of the things in this letter which suggests that Timothy might actually need to do something different to change what he does. Picture a big house, big family, servants, lots of plates, bowls, cups, etc. Some of them you use when the guests come to dinner. Others are only fit for having a bowl of cornflakes when you're snacking. And the purpose of the illustration, I think, is to indicate that a person can become a better sort of bowl, a more useful sort of bowl, a more honorable sort of bowl. I mean, it'd be interesting it doesn't really happen at home, does it, that bowls don't morph into one sort of, th into different things. But that's the way the illustration seems to work. And the outflow of the illustration is verse 22. So, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. What's Paul talking about here? I think he's talking about not getting involved in foolish fighting. I think in context, that's what the youthful passions are. Verse 23, foolish, ignorant controversy. There's a pattern to flee, and the pattern is the pattern of squabbling. We see it in verse 14. Charge them before God not to squabble about words. Uh, the them, interestingly, the them may be the them of verse 2. Maybe the people that Paul, uh, that Timothy is to be equipping uh, for the work. Be very easy, wouldn't it, for people who are on side with Timothy to become very affronted and angry because of the kind of opposition that Timothy's getting. 
Well, Paul says, remind them not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Let's put this in context. You're training up your new guys, verse 2. They, like you, are very unhappy about the way that things are. What do people do when untruth is being peddled in church? Well, so often, they get very upset by it. And what do they do about when they get upset? They get their Bible and their bazooka out, and they have a showdown. And, says Paul, that is not good for the hearer. It only ruins the hearers, verse 14. And you've got to have the hearer in mind if you're a teacher. Not just the argument, but those listening to the argument. You see, you might win the fight, but if you fight, how, is it, how likely is it that the onlooker will be won? It's often the case in church life that when there are disputes about truth, nobody quite knows who to believe. Confusion is often common. And your content might be good, but the only people who are drawn to you if you plaster your opponent to the wall is people who like looking at fighting. In general, in general, if you fight verbally, or physically, the onlooker is lost to you. Doesn't matter if you're right. Doesn't matter how true the content or how good your argument, the manner of your argument is crucially important. And the pattern to follow, the pattern that Paul wants Timothy to follow is very stretching indeed. Look at verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. I take it that's enduring hostility towards himself, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now, folks, What's being, what's being put forward here is very, very difficult to do. Generally, depending on our temperament, we deal with malicious and untrue talk in two ways. If we're a scrapper, we fight back. If we're not such a scrapper, we run and hide and lob hand grenades from a distance. This is quite different from that, isn't it? Patiently enduring hostility, correcting opponents with gentleness. Patient engagement and gentle correction. This is very difficult to do. But that is the way to keep the door to repentance open. For when you fight someone, You give them reasons to stay where they are. Reasons to not listen to what you're saying. Reasons to dig their toes in and become entrenched. If you fight back, you can pretty much guarantee that the person you're fighting with won't repent. I remember um, uh, when we worked in Nottingham having a... Uh, an African pastor coming to to talk to our church uh, uh, pastoral team. And he came from sub-Saharan Africa, a region of great persecution of Christians, way back then and now. And his, um, his, his big prayer request was, please pray that the Christians won't fight back. Because when Christians start killing Muslims in response the game is over for gospel advance. The game's over. If you retaliate, the game's over. Now, the same is true on a smaller scale. 
If you squabble in church, if you fight in public, the game is over. People will not buy in to what you're saying. So I think it's difficult to know exactly how Timothy is being influenced by this falsehood, drawn towards it. But there is an impression in this chapter that one of the ways that he needs to change is not become so involved in what he may have become involved in, namely fighting, squabbling, trying to hold his end up, trying to keep things on Paul's side. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Kind to those who are not kind to you. There's a great deal of conflict in this chapter, and for both Paul and Timothy, there are real difficulties to be endured. For Paul, unjust punishment, uh, unjust imprisonment and execution. For Timothy, enduring evil. And the big thing here in which change may be necessary is how Timothy, and probably those who are on side with him, need to respond to hostility. One of the features of our human condition is that we respond to sinful behavior in really dysfunctional ways often. Hostility particularly brings that on. And if you've been wickedly wickedly treated by a malicious enemy, as does happen from time to time in ministry life, the urge to fight back, to find some sort of vindication, to seek revenge is overwhelming. And great grace needs to be sought in such circumstances. It's so easy after being treated evilly to become combative in a kind of hyper alert sort of way. Always on the lookout for hostility. Always defensive. Acutely aware of any contrary opinion. Every disagreement can be viewed uh, viewed as enmity. Every upset as something to be fought. There are many, many angry men in Christian ministry. But the grace of the risen Christ is a magnificent thing because it enables the recipient of evil or injustice to want the good of the opponent. And that's what Paul wants Timothy to want. It enables pity. Look at verse 26. What does Paul want Timothy to want? That people will come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being taken captive to do his will. Wouldn't it be a great thing to have that kind of attitude? You see, if there's no pity for an enemy, if there's no pity for an enemy, we've not understood the dimensions of the spiritual battle that we're involved in. Wouldn't it be a great thing to pray for those in ministry who've been through trauma that they would pity their enemies? It'd be a great thing to pray for your pastors if they endure hostility, that they would be able to pity their enemies. And wouldn't it be great to take hold of God's sovereignty in trauma? Look at verse 10 again. What keeps Paul going in the difficult work of passing on the word of God? Well, confidence that God will use his endurance of suffering to save his elect. Now this is a wonderful thing. God's salvation of his chosen ones does not depend on the glorious appearance of his servants. Isn't that a relief? God's salvation of his elect does not depend on your church looking practically perfect in every way. It really doesn't. God's salvation of his elect does not depend on the skills and brilliance of your pastor. God's salvation of his elect does not depend on how brilliant you are. What a relief that is for Paul in prison facing execution or indeed for any of us facing difficulty in our, our big or little areas of ministry. 
God's salvation of his elect does not depend in us looking glorious at all. In fact, the damaging effects of those who've swerved from the truth will not shake what God is building. God is well able to build his thing. And the rescue of those who teach falsehood won't be accomplished by the frantic arguing of those who disagree with them. Repentance, verse 25, repentance belongs to God. Correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance. Okay, we're just about to close. Um, Look at verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Folks, we often read this verse and we think um, the essence, the essence of um, being an approved workman is being able to understand the Bible and teach it to other people. You know, to be a really sharp exegete. Of course, it's not helpful to be a poor exegete. It's not helpful. But the emphasis in this chapter is not so much on the brilliance of the talk. The emphasis on this chapter is on the manner of the talk. So you can be a brilliant preacher and teacher, but do it in a manner and with a combative edge that is entirely inappropriate for the message. Rightly handling the word of truth is as much to do with manner as it is with content. And of course, the two go together, don't they? For the gospel message, which is all about God's kindness towards a hostile world, has a manner which involves kindness towards a hostile world. The, talk, the message and the pattern go hand in hand with each other. All right, folks, we've got a few minutes before, just a minute or two before we close. Um, Timothy's in a very difficult situation. It would be very, very easy to fight. I've suggested to you that that may be one area in which he needs to change. Um, I'd like you, with your neighbor, please, to look at verse 22. And I want you to put yourself in, imagine yourself in a difficult situation ministry-wise, what might it look like to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart? In a situation where you'd love to have revenge, what might it look like to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with others? Just talk about that for a few moments. Uh, I'll give you two minutes to talk about that and then we'll pray. Okay, go. Okay, folks, you might like to carry on those conversations during the break. Let me uh, pray as we close this session. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the reminder in this passage of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who endured such hostility against himself for our salvation. We thank you for the encouragement that the Spirit of Christ produces in us the same pattern of his life. Cruciformity before death, glory following it. Uh, We pray, Lord, for those who we know who are in particular difficulty at the moment because of the gospel. And pray that you will help them to be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. To keep passing on the message faithfully. And to keep correcting error peaceably. We pray for ourselves when we run into difficulty in serving you. Pray that you will deliver us from desiring vengeance, retribution, validation. But we're willing to 
patiently endure difficulty, patiently correct untruth. Pray that you'll give us pity for opponents. Uh, Please help us, Heavenly Father, as we uh, talk about these things and continue to reflect on these things. Pray that you would work in us likeness to your Son. And we ask that this would bring great honor to him. And in his name we pray these things. Amen.